Thanks, Jim. I really appreciate it. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today. We're ahead of AEW Blood and Guts coming up tomorrow night on TBS. And it's a really big week with Ring of Honor, Death Before Dishonor coming up, as well as a big AEW collision in Newark. Uh, should be a great week of pro wrestling. I'm excited to talk about all of it. And uh, please feel free to ask anything about any of those you want to talk about. And with that, uh, Jim, take it away. Thanks, man. All right. Let's go. Steve Fall from the 10 Count. You're going to lead us off today, and then I'm going to follow Steve with a write-in question from Nikki Bushi from Women's Wrestling Talk. Steve, you're up. Hey, Tony. It's Steve Fall. I usually ask you about Goldberg, but not today because Blood and Guts huh. is happening in Boston, and I'll be there live. I cannot wait. But with rumors about more pay-per-views added to AEW's lineup, could Blood and Guts be its own pay-per-view? Do you see potential of having that match anchor an entire pay-per-view? Blood and Guts is certainly a pay-per-view worthy event. AEW Dynamite Blood and Guts has been one of our highest rated episodes of the show each of the past few years. So I think we found a really successful formula with that event on TBS on Dynamite. So for now, I think it's a great part of AEW television, but certainly it's the kind of great event that could be a pay-per-view show. I, I think for now, it's really a strong part of the TV lineup, at least certainly this year, I expect it will be, and in past years. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Steve. As promised, I've got a write-in here from uh, Nikki Bushi <clears throat> from uh, Women's Wrestling Talk. And Nikki, Nikki's question will be followed by Chris Mueller from Bleacher Report. Tony, here's Nikki's question. What would you like to see come out of the feud between Athena and Willow Nightingale? And how will this feud continue to grow the women's division for both AEW and Ring of Honor? Well, it's been a tremendous rivalry between Athena and Willow Nightingale. I thought their first one-on-one -on -one match on Ring of Honor television, it was actually the second episode of the new show, was tremendous. Our first taping, that was really the main event of the first taping, we taped two shows in Orlando, and it was excellent. I thought it was such a strong match that I really wanted to get back to it, and I was very happy they had such a great match in the semifinals of the Owen Hart Women's Cup Tournament. It was actually supposed to take place about a week earlier on Collision, and we change it up. And as I talk more about Ring of Honor, Death Before Dishonor, and some of the changes we've made along the way, uh, that was one thing that um, probably held us up from announcing the match a little bit sooner than I would have liked. But I wanted to make sure Willow was going to be okay. And we gave Willow some extra time to recover because in her match uh, in New Japan, Independence Day on July 5th, she got rocked in a match against Julia. And uh, whenever somebody... Um, is having any kind of head symptoms after a hard-hitting match. You want to give them some extra time to recover and make sure that they're good to go. So I, there was no certainty that Willow was even going to participate in the semifinals, let alone go on to win the entire tournament this past week. So uh, I thought Willow versus Athena on Friday night on Rampage was an excellent match. And Willow, of course, went on to win the entire tournament, beating Ruby Soho Saturday on Collision. And coming out of this great weekend for Willow, and given that the series is now even one-to-one, -one, I thought it was great for Willow to put out uh, really a, a challenge to Athena. And for me, I, it was a match I certainly wanted to make. So now given it's one-to-one, -one, I think the rubber match this Friday night on Death Before Dishonor is going to be excellent. Um, I, again, I would have liked to have probably announced it a little sooner the way the bracket was originally drawn up, but it's been an amazing, amazing rivalry through the first two matches, and I'm very excited about the rubber match this Friday night, and we'll see where the rivalry between Athena and Willow Nightingale goes from there. Both of them are great, very decorated champions in wrestling now, with Athena as the longtime Ring of Honor Women's World Champion and having a dominant reign so far. And Willow's on this amazing run. She's held the New Japan Strong Women's Championship this year and, of course, uh, just won the Owen Hart Cup last week. So it should be very exciting and a lot of great momentum for both women going into what I'm sure will be a great rubber match on Friday night, Death Before Dishonor, Willow Nightingale versus Athena for the Ring of Honor Women's World Championship.
Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Nikki. Chris Mueller from Bleacher Report, you are up next. <clears throat> and Chris will be followed by Dominic D'Angelo from Ad Free Shows. Chris. Hey, Tony. So hey. Heading, in, heading into Blood and Guts, we had a lot of people online who were hoping and looking forward to a potential women's Blood and Guts match, especially because so many women on the roster have had some great hardcore matches over the last year or two. Was that a consideration heading into the match, making a, a women's blood and guts? And did Jamie Hayter's injury potentially throw those plans off? I think it w would have been an, an interesting idea. It could have been a great match. I definitely think um, with Jamie Hayter's injury, it's probably a five-on-five five there, given uh, some of the depth issues, and especially given Willow Nightingale just, just got back and putting her in that kind of match after she had a major head injury in Japan uh, probably wouldn't be very smart. And um, we've had some other major injuries there. And I think uh, if when there was some fan momentum for that idea, I think the outcast versus uh, Jamie and Britt and a number of others was really running red hot. And um, I think Jamie Hader was a big part of that. So, yeah, I do think um, some of the momentum for that, you know, when Jamie Hader was running hot as champion um, was there. And uh, I'm not sure at this moment, given some of the injuries and stuff we had, that that was feasible. Also, with so many of the women participating this week in the Owen Hart Cup tournament, it is a very, very hard-hitting match, and there's a lot of attrition for it. From it, we've had major injuries. Santana has not participated in pro wrestling since the last Blood and Guts, and the women's division has been pretty beat up. They've really beaten the hell out of each other, frankly, and overseas. So, um, probably was not a feasible idea for them this year. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Dominic D'Angelo from Ad Free Shows is next, and Dominic will be followed by Stephanie Chase from Digital Spy. Dom? By the way, I would like to, uh, can I re uh, reiterate one other thing? Absolutely. Again? Please. Two of the great, two of the best hardcore wrestlers we've had have been Penelope and the Bunny, and they've uh, had some excellent hardcore matches themselves. They also have not participated in wrestling in a long time from doing these kinds of matches. So um, that is another consideration. Thanks, Chris. Okay, Dominic? Okay. Hey, Tony, how are you? This is Dominic. Good to speak with you again. Hey, Dom. Hey, okay. So a uh, question I had for you. Uh, there was a report running around, I believe, on Fightful Select about uh, – uh, regulations regarding move sets and everything like that and certain uh, protocols to go through, talking through coaches or talking to the medical staff. I wondered, curious, are you guys going to be more considerate of that or has that always kind of been in place for the most part or are there changes kind of further developing with that list? I think it's a lot of informal policies that had been spoken but not necessarily written in such detail. And... Um, I don't want to confirm the, the, everything in that document you saw online is accurate, but I do think um, we are taking safety seriously, and we always have. And I think uh, that means constantly evolving your standards and looking at quality control, and I think that's something we've been doing. And uh, it made a lot of sense to take a look at things that have caused injuries, not in AEW always necessarily, but just in pro wrestling in general, and look at adopting what best practices are for the industry. Thanks, man. Thanks, Dominic. Stephanie Chase, Digital Spy, you are next. And I'm going to follow Stephanie with uh, a write-in question from Dave Meltzer at the Wrestling Observer. Steph? Hi, Tony. How are you? I'm very well. How are you, Steph? I'm great. Thanks, Tony. Um, we've got Kota Ibushi in the Blood and Guts match tomorrow night. Can you tell us anything about the process of getting Kota to come in and what his future might look like with AEW? Well, I'm very excited about Kota Ibushi debuting in AEW this week on Wednesday Night Dynamite on Blood and Guts. It is a major thing in the wrestling culture. This is a, a big event, Blood and Guts. And to have a huge star like Kota Ibushi, who's one of the top international names in pro wrestling, debut in AEW, it's a huge statement for the company. And I really think there's so many cool things happening in AEW right now. Uh, and this is an amazing 
a cherry on top of the great ice cream Sunday we've been putting together in recent weeks. And I think Kota Ibushi is one of the great stars. Uh, it's op- it's no secret he's got a great relationship with Kenny Omega. I've seen he's posted photos with Kenny Omega and Knock uh, to let people know that uh, this is real. He's really coming. Uh, Kenny Omega was essential in putting that agreement together for Kota Ibushi to come in for Blood and Guts. And I haven't talked to Kota Ibushi personally before this event in a long time. Uh, we talked a while back, a long time ago, about working together, and I'm really glad that it's finally happening. Um, it's truly, truly something that got me very, very excited about Wednesday night that Kota Ibushi is going to be in AEW, and Blood and Guts is always one of our biggest events. You can always count on big stars in the Blood and Guts match, and we wanted to do something very special. This event is sponsored by Shark Week and our partners at Warner Brothers Discovery giving us that great endorsement. So it's important to us to make it a big event, and I think the arrival of Kota Ibushi is the kind of thing that fits blood and guts like a glove with big star power and adding a new layer to this amazing rivalry between the elite and the Blackpool Combat Club that's already included an incredible five stars in many people's opinion, uh, Anarchy in the Arena match in the main event at Double or Nothing this year. And I think the rivalry goes back a long way through many iterations, many combinations, certainly not not involving Kota Ibushi to this point. And I think his arrival comes at a perfect time for AEW when we have so many interesting things going on in the company right now. I'm very grateful to Kenny Omega for many things, including – uh, bringing Kota Ibushi to the table to make this a possibility with Kota Ibushi debuting tomorrow night on Wednesday Night Dynamite in AEW Blood and Guts. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. <clears throat> uh, I've got a write-in question here, Tony, from Dave Meltzer at the Wrestling Observer. We're going to follow this question with Bill Pritchard at WrestleZone. So Dave asked the following, what are your thoughts after four years now as the optimum number of pay-per-view shows per year? And is there any accuracy to All In as being a pay-per-view this year? Uh, I will talk more about the availability of all. Oh, so so we start with that, and then we'll go back, Jim. You can ask me the first part again. Um, I will confirm in due time and soon the details about AEW All In. It will take place on Sunday, August 27th. It will be – everyone will be able to watch it live. It will be uh, – taking place in the evening UK time, which means in the afternoon on the East Coast and uh, in that late morning slot on the West Coast. I know it's a viable slot for exciting live sports programming because it will be a very similar slot to where the NFL would run. Obviously, this will be uh, a couple weeks before NFL football kicks off by design, honestly, and it is a great bank holiday weekend in the UK, so it'll be a great spot in prime time in the UK. And uh, here in the US, it'll be airing in kind of that 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific Sunday NFL window, which I think is a great spot. And uh, as far as the availability of it, we'll talk more about that with our partners, but we've got a great relationship with Warner Brothers Discovery, and typically our pay-per-view events have run through Bleacher Report. Uh, and as for the international carriers on this and uh, the availability of certain replays and things like that, uh, there'll be more to come. But I do see this as one of our biggest events, commensurate with our biggest pay-per-views, and we'll tell you more about it very soon. Okay, Tony, Dave's other question was, what are your thoughts uh, after four years now of doing this as to the optimum number of pay-per-view shows per year? Well, I think it's evolving. It's a great question. Uh, I don't know if Dave's on the line to get into a discussion about it, but Dave has generally and been one of the leading experts on wrestling business economics and has written an extensive amount on the history of pro wrestling and the revenues and business cycles and things people have learned. 
I believe no wrestling company that has ever expanded its pay-per-view calendar due to demand and economics has ever regretted that decision. I think in general, there have been factors that have helped pro wrestling companies rise and fall over the years, but I do think that expanding your pay-per-view calendar has often been something that has been seen as revenue positive and been overall positive for companies. And uh, certainly when there was competition in pro wrestling in the past, more pay-per-views was the standard. I think for us, we've launched with, to me, a very methodical plan. We built a really solid calendar of major events. And to date, our big pay-per-view events are Revolution, uh, Double or Nothing, uh, Forbidden Door in partnership with New Japan Pro Wrestling, which has been a great success and the biggest debut of any of our events. And now we've got, of course, All Out and Full Gear. Now All In comes into the discussion as well. So now we're talking about six major events. And again, uh, we'll talk more about All In, but six events that are certainly at least pay-per-view worthy events uh, at a minimum. And as for expanding the calendar even further, it, it's something we've talked to Warner Brothers Discovery about, and it is something everybody believes could potentially be revenue positive. Um, so I think that's something to certainly consider, but I'm very happy with what we built. And I think, you know, when people look back through wrestling history, it had been a long time since anybody had had the kind of success as a challenger brand we've had really since the 1990s uh, that anybody has had the kind of numbers we've put up on pay-per-view as a challenger. So uh, it's something that I'm thinking, obviously you could probably tell from the length of this answer and some of the things I'm saying, it's something I'm giving a lot of consideration to. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Dave, for the question. Um, Bill Pritchard from WrestleZone, you are next, and I'm going to follow Bill with a write-in from Kimmy Sokol from The Pop Break. Bill. Okay, there I'm unmuted. Tony, how are you? Hey, I'm very well, Bill. How are you? Good. Uh, so I wanted to ask about uh, the Death Before Dishonor main event. I know uh, the injury to Mark Briscoe is unfortunate, but that leaves Claudio without a challenger, and there's a lot of speculation that perhaps the Blood and Guts match will play into that. Maybe one of the participants in that match will be Claudio's opponent. Can you talk about the accuracy of that or maybe just what the plans are as far as announcing that match or the, the, the world title match for death before dishonor yes uh well it's been a challenging process i really appreciate you asking me and giving me the forum to talk a little bit about it i'm very excited about the death before dishonor pay-per-view and the card i have slotted right now is very strong we've announced a few matches and more in recent days because of injuries leading into the event. I've had to make changes upon changes, and it really started when I did something I felt very strongly about. It wasn't my first choice, but it was the right thing to do. And that was when I let Eddie Kingston go over and participate in the G1. And I sat with Eddie and Rocky in my office in Orlando. Uh, and to pull back the curtain a little bit, you know, there's people you have relationships in this business with, and then there's people you have really, really strong relationships in this business with. And Eddie is one of the latter for me. And he's uh, more, more than somebody I just work with in wrestling. He's, uh, he's a good friend, and I really care about him and his well-being. And it's one of those things that I know very well, and I feel like wrestling fans know. And everyone feels like even if you don't know Eddie personally, like you kind of know him just a very relatable person in my opinion and it's what part of why he's such a compelling wrestling personality i really love eddie and he really wanted to go over and participate in the g1 so it involved a major pivot from some of the things we've been doing because i think eddie had been a major focus and a major direction and certainly uh, eddie and claudio their rivalry and uh, the hatred they have for each other is far from over claudio's been a dominant champion, but certainly I would love to see another match between Eddie and Claudio at some point. Uh, and now with Claudio, 
uh, I was looking to get the best possible challenger for him. And given uh, the situation, and I was hoping maybe even some possibility that Eddie could fly back to participate in Death Before Dishonor and then go back to Japan, and I certainly would have accommodated the travel if that was possible. It wasn't possible. And Mark Briscoe, I had slotted for something different in the card. Uh, well, it turned out that that, was also not viable for another reason I'll get into in a, in a moment, but there have been so many things that came up, and it can be like a domino effect, and it's very challenging, and I get why people would say just start announcing stuff, but there's a reason why you don't want to just start announcing stuff, especially when the dominoes start to fall like this and you start moving people from one match to another. So then with Mark Briscoe's injury, which is, of course, you know something you asked me about, uh, it was very challenging because Mark had – been dealing with injuries for a while and and you, I think some of us almost took it for granted because Mark is such a fighter and he's such an amazing person with an amazing spirit and I think Mark is another person who so many people really feel like they can relate to and uh, people really uh, sympathize with Mark Briscoe I think for, for many reasons but but also I think he's just such a compelling wrestling character and always has been and it's why I, I've wanted to work with him for a long time and why I enjoy working with him now so much so I felt like Mark could be an emotional hook for this pay-per-view in a lot of ways and it, it was a you know a pivot so with Eddie going to Japan I thought it would be very cool with Eddie having this big moment winning the strong championship if Eddie you know from his big moment, passed on some wisdom to Mark Briscoe. And Eddie, if he were to say, as he essentially did, you know, this is a big moment for him now. He's a champion, and he's got to speak to somebody he cares about, which is true. Eddie really does care about Mark. I've seen it firsthand, and, and he's been there for him. And, and you know, he's part of that, that crew of people that, that uh, would do anything for Mark, like so many of us. And I... I really, really wanted this to be such a great moment for Mark. And then I thought, you know, with Eddie going to Japan, there's a chance to make it an even better moment death before dishonor for Mark. And uh, I will, I knew he was dealing with some injuries, but honestly, he'd been dealing with them for a long time. But I think the pain had become too much to manage, and I think it was, you know, getting very challenging for him. And to be honest, he hadn't really told a lot of people that, including our doctors. And, uh, but the people who knew him really well and knew he was hurting, I think Mark was no selling it. And I know he was no selling the doctors a little bit on how much pain he was in. And that's why they were a little surprised by how much this had become a, a lifestyle challenge to him that like he was really beat up and it was, it was starting to affect his life. So when, when he came to me and said, look, it's worse than I've been letting on and, you know, I'm not sure I can do this. Well, that meant changing everything. And uh, we had shot a lot of stuff when we went to Mark. We had shot weeks of promos. Claudio went on a training sabbatical for Blood and Guts. He'd been in Switzerland. So we had shot weeks of promos and put all the pay-per-view materials together with Mark. But if Mark Briscoe comes to me and says he needs something, I'm going to do it no matter what it is. And if he needs time to heal up, and needs me to pivot the pay-per-view, I'm going to do that for him without question. I do that for pretty much anybody, but I'll do it with a smile for Mark Briscoe. And so that meant changing pretty much everything again. And I would have had Willow Athena announced a week sooner, but that involved pushing Willow's match in the Owen back, and there was a chance Willow wasn't going to compete in the Owen at all in the semifinals and finals, let alone win the entire tournament. So then from a medical perspective, you're looking at that and saying there's no certainty as to how Willow's going to feel next week, but I'm going to postpone her match and postpone the death before dishonor announcement. Shibata, I'd always had scheduled to come over this past week because he wasn't supposed to be the first match we announced. Uh, but I did think it was a really important to do a press conference and get him and Garcia face-to-face -face, given the last two times they were in the ring what happened at Forbidden Door and that TV match where Garcia got the pin on Shibata, which I haven't talked much about on this call, but I would like to at some point. And uh, that was a really uh, 
great tag team match, I thought, with Garcia getting the win, and I really loved the four-way match they participated in for the international title at Forbidden Door. And so that, uh, that got announced this week. Um, there's been uh, other changes to the card, including some stuff involving the television title uh, that uh, you wouldn't even believe. Uh, <laughs> some of the circumstances, it's just been some crazy stuff. Um, and uh, we're very fortunate to have a great TV title match on the card. Samoa Joe uh, versus the winner of the Eliminator, Dalton Castle and Shane Taylor wrestling on Thursday night. Um, we're very fortunate to have such a great TV champion at all with Samoa Joe, the king of television. He's so great and uh, very grateful he'll be participating on the pay-per-view now. There's been so many changes and things that have come up along the way. It's been probably along with last year's Forbidden Door, the most challenges I've had going into the build of the pay-per-view. And many of you would remember all the things that happened because Forbidden Door was another event where you had like a wave of injuries and I had to make a bunch of changes and then another another wave of injuries and you had to make another wave of changes. So it was almost like a pivot on top of a pivot. And I think that's what we had to do here. Um, but what I hope and believe is we'll have an amazing show that forbidden door last year turned out to be in the opinion of many people, one of the greatest pay-per-view events of all time and was voted uh, by the readers of multiple publications last year to be the best wrestling event of 2022, despite all the challenges we had in the build leading up to it. So I'm really hopeful that it's going to be a great match. Now, my long winded answer to your question leading back to Claudio uh, will address Claudio's opponent and who the champion will face for the world title uh, this week. But as I as I referenced in there, Claudio had shot a lot of stuff for the Mark Briscoe match. And he has a huge week with a world title defense two days after one of the most barbaric, uh, toll-taking matches in all of pro wrestling, the Blood and Guts match on Wednesday night, in which he's a major participant. So he had, he had planned a, a training sabbatical in Switzerland, and he's back now. And I think this week we'll address his death before dishonor opponent, which will, will be a great match. And, uh, of course, he's got the huge blood and guts match on Dynamite coming up. So I know that was a lot, but it's been a lot leading into this pay-per-view. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Tony, I've got a, a write in here from Kimmy Sokol. She's with the Pop Break. Her, and after Kimmy, by the way, Brandon Thurston from WrestleNomics will be next. Kimmy's question is, how do you determine, how did you determine the tag teams for the fatal four-way tag title match for Death Before Dishonor? Well, I don't want to, I, 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 first of all, I, I try to avoid, I think, uh, the fatal uh, is, a, uh, is a WWE term, but it's a four-way match. Uh, so, uh, it, yes. The four teams, that's another great one. It's so funny that's the question, Jim, because that was like as I was finishing up that last answer, there was one thing I thought I wish I'd referenced in there, and I didn't, and then you just teed me up with a great question to answer it. So thank you both for that. Uh, the four-way match is another thing. As we've been doing the shows, there have been some challenges along the way. I think the kingdom have been – an amazing team in the tag team division. I thought they would be great to participate, and they picked up some big wins on Ring of Honor TV recently. Uh, best friends have participated on a number of Ring of Honor shows before I owned the company and uh, a number of the TV shows in recent months and have done very well. They're one of the top tag teams in the world, and they've had a great rivalry with the Lucha Brothers. And the Lucha Brothers, of course, are great champions. I think it's tremendous for us. Uh, to have such big stars as champions. Uh, going back to some of the things I've mentioned, there have been a couple of things where we weren't able to get both Lucha Brothers at times on certain tapings, which is why you've seen them wrestling at times as singles. Uh, some of that was due to some of the challenges of taping the Ring of Honor on Saturdays when there's a lot of Lucha Libre shows that they had committed months in advance to. Uh, now some of those commitments are changing, uh, and the Lucha Brothers are two of the greatest stars in all the world and great tag team champions uh, of any company and, of course, great representatives for Ring of Honor and Aussie Open. So with all the stuff with injuries, I mentioned 
some stuff with uh, people where I was held up from making a match, uh, maybe, but then it turned out great, and now it's uh, worked out for the best with Willow coming back from the injury and winning the Owen Hart Cup and now challenging Athena for the world title in the rubber match. Of course, injuries are going to keep Mark Briscoe out of death before dishonor, but one very cool thing that was not a certainty is Mark Davis healed up. And Kyle Fletcher had been wrestling some singles matches and teaming with other members of the United Empire, in both AEW and Ring of Honor. And Kyle Fletcher was doing great. But Aussie Open is also one of the top tag teams in the world. And very happy for Mark Davis that he's come back from his injury. And Aussie Open, when we launched this new Ring of Honor TV, they were one of the featured teams. They had some great matches. I think one of the best matches we've had on the ROH TV has been Aussie Open versus Matt Seidel and Christopher Daniels, which is the former World Tag Team Champions of ROH, which was a great match. And uh, I thought all four teams would be perfect for this four-way match. And uh, when we got the clearance that Mark was good to go and Aussie Open were cleared to participate, uh, they had been one of the top teams on the ROH TV before the injury, so I thought they would make perfect sense. But again, that was a match I would have liked to have been able to announce sooner, but I think it made sense to wait until uh, I was sure Mark Davis was going to be able to participate. So uh, there have been uh, a few things that have worked out for the better on the show, but overall with uh, injuries and, and some of the circumstances and even you know a choice I made, to let Eddie go to Japan, and and I, it's one of those things where you know I feel like AEW, Ring of Honor, and New Japan are so closely tied together in an ecosystem of wrestling, where Eddie making that trip to Japan is going to be good for everyone, especially him, which is to be honest in that situation what I care about the most, and that he's going to come back, I believe, stronger, pun intended, uh, and in a in a better position than when he left and you know we'll still have a great death before dishonor and and eddie will be back mark will be back and uh in this case mark davis is back so that is uh kind of one of the reasons why uh that match came together as it has i think all three of the teams that have been healthy uh, are great teams to participate and three of the top teams and now Aussie Open is back too. So it should be a great match. Thanks, Tony. Thank you, Kimmy, for that question. Brandon Thurston, Russellnomics. Brandon, you're up next and Brandon will be followed by Jim Barcelone at the Miami Herald. Hi, Tony. Thanks again for your time today. Hey, thank you. Thanks for talking to me today. So, the, the ratings just came out for Collision and Battle of the Belts, and the ratings seem to, to have been pretty good for, you know, it's a three-hour block of TV for the first time, I believe, in AW history. And it got me to thinking, if, would you be open to a third hour of Dynamite? I know you, you said in the past when Rampage was coming out that there was discussion about a third hour of Dynamite, but that you didn't want to do it. And I understand there's a stigma around a three-hour wrestling show because of Raw and people thinking, you know, that's too long of a wrestling show. But in, in terms of thinking how to maximize the best ratings for AEW to the network. If I, I would Great think a third, I would think a third hour dynamite would do a better rating state than, than Rampage is doing. So is that something that, that you would be open to in this, this next TV deal maybe? Well it's an interesting question. It's something I'd have to think about a lot. Um, well You know, it's a great question. Looking at the ratings, I think we all got the same data today. You know, I'm, I'm to be honest, I'm the chart. I haven't. You're somebody, Brandon. I was actually you're, as an expert on WrestleNomics as you are. I was looking at the chart. I was a little confused when I got it back because I don't know if you you, you may not have seen it yet, but um, in the top ten, they actually have uh, Collision and Battle of the Belts both listed twice. In the top ten, both both shows in the top five, and then again in the top ten. And I'm not sure if that's because of the power outage from the hailstorm that they got listed as separate shows. But normally the West Coast feeds are part of the national ratings, so I'm not sure what that's about. So that's one thing I'm looking at. 
But uh, no matter what, the ratings were very strong and positive for the three-hour block of television. And maybe even I'm, I'm trying to ascertain what those uh, replay numbers mean, if they're part of the total number like they would normally be or what that means. But when I got the chart today, we finished – both shows finish in the top five, and then again, again in the top ten. They're both listed twice. So I don't know what that means exactly. Normally we don't see it like that. Um, so, uh, but re regardless, regardless of that, I think it was a very, very strong number. And uh, I'm trying to figure out if it was even stronger than, than on the surface or why it's listed twice. For uh, the three-hour block, it's not as you – alluded to it's not something we've ever done before it was the first time we ever tried it it did very well it held up very well um, and it's something wrestling companies are doing every week uh, and it, it for you know I can't comment as to whether it's something we'd plan doing on a regular basis on the future but I, I would certainly say I would expect based on the success of that number that Battle of the Belt in future quarters would make sense after collision. So I think, you know, the, the first time we did three hours of live television, I know was considered a success by the network. So now uh, the question is, is that something we would want to do going forward? Uh, and I'll have to talk to them about it because obviously, as you know very well, Brandon, the numbers just came in here in the last few hours and we're still digging through them. So it's something to analyze and think about. But certainly as a three-hour block of wrestling on Saturday night, it did very well, and I'm not sure what that would mean for future weekends or uh, Wednesdays. Uh, but I do think on a weekly basis we found a really good rhythm with two hours of Dynamite, uh, two hours of Collision, and now one hour of Rampage 2. And, uh, you know, how those hours are allocated, it's uh, something to certainly think about, but I'm glad that it went well this weekend. and gave people something to think about. So thanks. Thank you, Brandon. <clears throat> Jim Barcelona from the Miami Herald is next, and I'm going to follow Jim with a write-in question from Ella J., a wrestling gal. Jim. Thank you both. I'm curious, because obviously health and safety is concern, and I know you mentioned it a little bit about, I guess, what was written out there about some of the rules that are now written for that but I am curious, too, with TV and pay-per-view, still taking in mind that safety and health are the concern, but is there a little more leeway in what wrestlers' talent can do on a pay-per-view compared to a TV show? And thank you. I do think that there are things you can do on a pay-per-view and on a, in a big match uh, that can push the boundaries. And I'm one who likes to push the boundaries on many things. Safety is not the best thing to push the boundaries on, though. Uh, so I guess it depends. It really depends. It's a situational thing, and there's some people in a certain situation, to be honest, I would let do something that I probably wouldn't trust to other people. And, you know, if Kenny Omega uh, wants to do something, I think that's a lot different than one of the kids who has come up through AEW Dark or, you know, uh, somebody in a dark match wanting to do something that's a uh, 180 degrees different uh, than you know uh, somebody like uh, well, again like like Kenny Omega who uh, has done a lot of stuff that other people would consider that it looks very uh, dangerous but I don't think people really understand what he does or how he does it so uh, you know I, I do think that it depends on who it is and what it is and you know, I'm. I take almost everything in life on a case by case basis. I don't think a cookie cutter rule of thumb necessarily is good to apply to everybody, but I do think there's good standards that we can hold up as a general rule of thumb. And then whether it's a big show or a pay per view or a big episode of Dynamite or Collision, uh, you know, then you can look at doing things a little differently. And certainly, um, in some cases, rules are made to be examined or, or changed, and, and in other cases, uh, there's stuff that I just think is common sense. So it just really depends on who it is and what it is. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. Tony, I've got a question uh, right in from Ella J, and Ella's question will be followed by live uh, and in color, Phil Strum from the USA Today Network. 
Here's Ella's question. Is there interest in sanctioning a rematch for the New Japan Pro Wrestling Strong women's title between Julia and Willow Nightingale on AEW slash Ring of Honor turf? Yeah, I definitely am interested in that. Uh, obviously, the last match they had was very hard-hitting. Uh, I do think it would be a great match, and I am interested in that. We'll see what happens with Willow Nightingale and Athena. Uh, will Willow Nightingale hold both the Owen Hart uh, 2023 tournament championship as well as the Ring of Honor Women's World Championship, and then uh, would it make sense to challenge for the New Japan Strong Championship? That is certainly uh, a very exciting series of events. That would be very interesting. Uh, I think we'll have to see what happens this Friday night on pay-per-view at Death Before Dishonor with Athena versus Willow and what kind of condition Willow's in because uh, the last time she wrestled Julia, she uh, was injured. And, uh, you know, she's got to get out of this match in one piece with with Athena, who's one of the most dangerous wrestlers in the sport. So I think, uh, you know, and I say that, uh, obviously, the you know, the persona of Athena, I think, uh, is a, knowing her, she's an incredible professional. But um, I do think, you know, it's going to be a great hard-hitting, world title match at Death Before Dishonor with Athena versus Willow, and we'll have to see where both women are at coming out of that. I think Julia would be a, a great, great wrestler to come in to either Ring of Honor or AEW, and I do think uh, Julia as the New Japan Strong Women's Champion uh, is somebody that certainly would be interested in having wrestling with us here. Thank you. Thank you, Ella. Phil Strum from the USA Today Network is next, and Phil will be followed by Kevin Kellum from Sports Kita. Phil. Hi, Tony. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. Uh, I've been enjoying Ring of Honor. Uh, you have some talent who have been mostly exclusive to Ring of Honor, the Kingdom, the Righteous, Stu Grayson, Blake Christian, and others. Do you intend, as this evolves, to kind of keep it that way? And do you think that there's kind of an opportunity to develop talent and acts through Ring of Honor and even maybe some of your partnerships with some of the independent companies? Thanks. It's a great question. I think there is benefit to having some people appearing regularly on Ring of Honor, but I'm also looking to cycle it and people doing really well in Ring of Honor. It may make sense for them to stay there and continue doing what they're doing and keeping that momentum that they have. Uh, but then if spots in AEW open up where we could use them, I think it's very exciting to have that kind of flow. And that's why I want to manage that ecosystem. And I work really closely, as I mentioned before, with New Japan. And I really believe what we've built now in the partnership is a system where with AEW and Ring of Honor, we host a lot of talent from New Japan. Uh, we've talked about how Willow has been the New Japan Strong Women's Champion. Now Will is challenging for the Ring of Honor Women's World Championship. Shibata, uh, I've talked a little bit about him on this call, but Shibata is such a huge part of Ring of Honor now as the pure champion, and he's been great. He's stepping into the ring with somebody who's got a massive week. We're going to see Daniel Garcia on the Blood and Guts Dynamite. He's got a huge match, teaming with Sammy Guevara against MJF and Adam Cole. I think it's really interesting dynamics with both teams. And Daniel Garcia also has this incredible opportunity to regain the Ring of Honor Pure Championship. He holds a win over Shibata. I think this is a very compelling match. The press conference got very heated this past weekend. It's been great to have Shibata here in our locker room. And, you know, every match he has, I never want to take it for granted given what he's been through and everything he's endured and undertaken to get to this point in his career. And it is a very important match, I believe, in Ring of Honor. It's an important match to me personally. And I think uh, there is a special identity to this new Ring of Honor, but it also is part of as I said, an ecosystem with AEW and New Japan where wrestlers can come in and out, flow, work with each other. 
there are some differences. You know, I've, I've talked about it a little bit before, but uh, we're home to a lot of the wrestlers from New Japan. We're also home to a lot of stars from Lucha Libre, and at times those things don't necessarily uh, work <laughs> together. <laughs> and so uh, it means uh, being flexible and building the cards and sometimes having to make changes uh, to accommodate your partners as best you can. And with Ring of Honor, I think a couple, well, I, I, with Ring of Honor, I think several people have stepped up and mostly appeared on those shows. But, it, you know, there's also good potential. Some of those people could appear in AEW and then uh, also wrestle overseas. And I also think we've got the ability to cycle people from AEW and other international companies into Ring of Honor and uh, give people different kinds of opportunities. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Phil. Kevin Kellum from Sports Kita is next, and we will wrap up today then with John Pollock, who will follow Kevin from Post Wrestling. Kevin? Thank you for the time. Uh, Tony, uh, obviously, Blood and Guts, Death War for Dishonor, huge shows, and then they really set the path as we head towards London, Wembley with All In, followed by All Out. So much to look forward to. A uh, very big period here. All in. This is the ma the biggest event you guys have ever produced live as a company. Uh, massive event. Going to be a lot of fans, a lot of expectations. And then you have All Out, which is the biggest annual event. Can we talk about how fans can expect more than they're expecting with these events? People are talking dream matches, all these different things. Obviously, you can't give anything away at this point. But what can you talk about the scale of this event leveling up to those big fan expectations? Well, the event is certainly the biggest in AEW's history, and I think All In is already, based on every business metric available to, at this point, All In is already one of the biggest wrestling shows in the history of the world. It stands currently over a month away from the event without any of the matches yet announced as we really, I think, should get through this week, get through blood and guts and see where we stand as a company with so many huge matches ahead this week across uh, Dynamite and, uh, of course, going into Collision this week and we'll have uh, another exciting weekend planned. I think uh, in the coming weeks, the all-in card is going to take shape. It's going to be very exciting. And... I believe at this point it's fair to say the interest in the card based on the interest in AEW and our debut show in Europe, our debut show in the UK, and of course our first time in London then, uh, it's, it stands uh, that currently the show is only alongside a few of the very highest grossing WrestleMania events all time. as one of the top few wrestling events in the history of the planet. And that is very, very awesome for AEW. I think it uh, speaks so highly of the interest in AEW, particularly in the UK, where AEW has been the number one wrestling company on television for a long time. And for us to become, in many ways now, the industry leader in the UK, that is a huge step for us as a wrestling company and we can continue to take those steps and plant our flag around the world. But this one is very special to me because London is a home to me and it's really one of the most important cities to me in my life. And it's one of the most important cities, I think to everyone in the world. And I am so proud that we're going to Wembley stadium where my family has a lot of history with the Jaguars and with Fulham football club. And I believe AEW All In is going to be our greatest event ever. And this summer is a really exciting time for us. There are a lot of cool things happening in AEW. It's been amazing. The launch of Collision has been excellent. I feel really good about uh, Collision five weeks into the show and what we've done. And to have something new with AEW Collision while there are a lot of exciting things happening across Dynamite and Rampage, just looking at this week with the Blood and Guts match 
and uh, the Jungle Boy and Hook rivalry and the Blind Eliminator final with MJF and Adam Cole taking on Sammy Guevara and Danny Garcia with the winners of that match. Looking forward to a championship match on Collision uh, next week. I think there's so much exciting stuff happening in AEW right now uh, that it's perfect timing for us to undertake such a massive event because uh, we have some stories that are really cooking right now. And uh, I think it's only going to continue to get bigger and better as the summer goes on, we're approaching 200 episodes of AEW Dynamite, which is a really important milestone for us. So in addition to launching Collision and having that going really well, uh, we've got the 200th episode of Dynamite coming up in a few weeks. I believe Blood and Guts this week will be episode 198. So a lot of really exciting things are happening, and I think it's a perfect flow. And I really do believe a lot of stuff is clicking now and will continue to click, and I think we're going to heat up and get really hot going into all in. So it's, it's very exciting. And to be honest, this is the most excited I've been about wrestling in probably about two years. And I was the only one who knew what was happening two years ago. And it ended up being a really exciting period for the company. And uh, I think there have been a lot of injuries and external challenges uh, to help us get back to that kind of a point. And this this event certainly is the biggest event in the history of our company and bigger than anything we've ever done before. And I think commensurate with that, a lot of the stories are starting to heat up and will continue to heat up in the weeks to come. And so that's something I'm really excited about. And, you know, uh, that is an honest statement. This is the most excited I've been about wrestling and the stuff we have lined up and are about to do in two years and two years ago that was a really exciting period in wrestling and i think we have the chance to do some exciting stuff here in the weeks and months to come thank you thanks kevin <clears throat> uh let's squeeze in the last one as we promised john pollock from post wrestling john you're going to bring it home hey tony uh we haven't heard from brian danielson since forbidden door and that was about an hour after his arm injury so i was just curious if there is any update he had thrown out that night the timetable of six to eight weeks if that's still a shooting target or if it's a bit more serious than that and as well while injured is he still contributing to the shows with consulting and throwing in other ideas it's been a little bit worse than i think anybody anticipated i don't want to put an exact timeline on it but uh brian is uh in the process of recovering and we can get into more details on it at a later date, but he's um, still engaged with me and I talk to Brian on a very regular basis. Uh, he hasn't been traveling to the shows and uh, coming to the meetings in person, but I still touch base with Brian all the time and uh, he's one of the people I'm closest to, I think for many reasons. And uh, he's, one of the most intelligent people I know. So I always like talking to him about ideas and thoughts and we really miss him. I think uh, it'll be great when he comes back. Certainly he would have been a tremendous participant in this blood and guts, but I do think there's so many exciting things happening right now and it would be amazing if Brian was in the match, but I do think uh, there's been this incredible silver lining and, uh, it came in the form of the hammer with pack and he is back and it's great to have him back. And I think this was a great opportunity to bring pack back not long after he had recovered from his injuries. And, uh, as soon as we possibly can, we'll get Brian back in. And, uh, and, uh even if it is a little bit longer than six to eight weeks, uh, he's rushing to get back as soon as he possibly can and pushing, and uh, nobody works harder on their body and themselves than Brian does. So I have full confidence that Brian will bounce back from this as soon as he possibly can. Thank you, John, and thank you, Tony. That is it. We're now at the end of our time. Tony, any closing thoughts? I do have a couple, Jim. I really appreciate everybody being here. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk with us today. Uh, Death Before Dishonor. It's available on cable, satellite, uh, Bleacher Report. Also, this event will be available for the first time ever on watchroh.com, where 
people also watch the TV for the Honor Club uh, on WatchROH.com. You can order the pay-per-view direct there for the first time ever, so that's something new in addition to all the other great carriers, cable, satellite, and uh, Bleacher Report have been great homes to the event, but now WatchROH.com carrying the event I think is great. Uh, and this is a huge week for us. Just to reiterate, Blood and Guts is going to be an amazing event. Thank you to everybody who's going to be joining us either in Boston for Blood and Guts or for either of the shows in New Jersey this weekend. Uh, big events with Death Before Dishonor and the Collision debut in Newark uh, at a great venue at the Prudential Center. It'll be a great week, hopefully, for my family. Also, uh, not a long trip from the Prudential Center down to Philadelphia for Fulham in our U.S. tour. Very excited about that. Uh, i just really grateful to everybody who joined us today uh, as I kind of elaborated on and, and gave uh, a look behind the curtain to some of the challenges with injuries and things that led to this event. I do think when the card comes together as the week uh, goes on, it, it will be a very strong pay-per-view card and one of the best Ring of Honor pay-per-view cards. And uh, I'm just grateful to you all for giving me a chance to talk about it and thanks for writing about it. And thank you, Jim, for hosting this. Absolutely. And hopefully see you all uh, this weekend and uh, just really, really appreciate you all. Thank you very much.